Now, let's turn to Professor Matthew Sack for his presentation. It's about policy efforts to balance copyright protection, industry development, and meet the emergence of AI technologies with a particular emphasis on case. I'm a professor of law in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science at Emory University in Atlanta. Today, I'd like to talk to you about copyright and generative AI. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about generative AI by now, large language models like GPT, Llama, etc., text to image models like stable diffusion and mid journey. But what's important to understand about generative AI, what really distinguishes it from some of the previous generations of machine learning technology is that generative AI today is trained on social media posts, book posts, articles, photos, digital art, music, software, and more. Previous generations of technology would have simply classified this material or predicted data arising from this material. Generative AI is different because it actually produces new digital artifacts, new music, new computer software, new art, and new text. And this, these artifacts are often indistinguishable from their human authored counterparts. Generative AI is already, I think, a transformative technology. When we add up the risks and rewards of generative AI, the risks begin with the bad things people can do with generative AI, misinformation, deepfakes, cy uh, cyber attacks, phishing emails. Generative AI might lead to the disclosure of private information. It might reflect existing social biases. Some people worry that generative AI will be too useful, that it will cause unemployment, that it will cause an unhealthy dependence on technology, that it will lead to cultural homogenization. And some people even worry that generative AI is one step down the road to super intelligent computer systems with agency, a capacity for real world action and misaligned incentives that could even destroy humanity. But on the plus side, Generative AI also offers us amazing potential for increased productivity, new creativity, broadening participation in all sorts of activities, no doubt revolutionizing education and training and accelerating scientific research and also making new forms of scientific research possible. Some benefits. Why is copyright law such a key issue for generative AI? It's not because copyright is a good tool for balancing these broader social questions. Copyright law is a key issue for generative AI because copyright law has a lot to say about copying. And there is a lot of copying underpinning modern generative AI. If you take something like GPT-4 or Llama, these LLMs were trained on millions of websites, hundreds of millions of copyrighted works. If you look at an image generation software like mid-journey or stable diffusion. These were trained on apparently billions of images paired with text descriptions. Now let's turn to the current US litigation landscape. Over the past 18 months, several lawsuits have been filed claiming that something about the process of creating or using generative AI infringes copyright. Most of these lawsuits have been filed on behalf of particular individuals purporting to represent a class of affected individuals. In the chart on the slide, you'll see that I've done some color coding so that you can see which lawsuits have been filed by the same law firm. The ones filed by the same law firm tend to be cookie cutter complaints. Some of them are in fact virtually identical. One of the key cases that's not filed as a class action is Getty Images suit against Stability AI. Given that long list of potential costs, rather than going through all of these lawsuits individually, what I'd like to do is present a sort of high level summary of the issues that they raise. I'm gonna begin with the non-intellectual property issues. These lawsuits, or at least many of them, raise allegations of violations of individual privacy rights. These are mostly under various state law claims. Uh, some of them also raise a particular issue of the failure to register as a data broker. All the ones filed in California tend to throw in a California unfair competition claim, as well as a theory of negligence that quite frankly, 
I find incomprehensible. I wouldn't pay much attention to the unfair competition and negligence claims. The privacy claims, I think, are worth considering, but I'm going to focus here today more on copyright issues. But before we get to copyright, these lawsuits, some of them at least, also raise claims under trademark law and right of publicity. And I will say Getty's trademark claim against Stable Diffusion seems fairly well grounded. Getty complains that Stable Diffusion is producing non-Getty images with the Getty watermark. If that's true, that seems like a fairly cut and dried uh, potential trademark action. All right, so let's think about copyright. The copyright claims in these lawsuits are a combination of at least some of the following. Many of these lawsuits raise a theory of removal of copyright management information, or CMI. Most of them argue that the process of gathering the training data involved copying and therefore was copyright infringement. And many of them look at the model and the outputs of the model as a form of copyright infringement as well. Let's go through these one by one. First of all, copyright theory zero, the removal of CMI. I call this copyright theory zero because it doesn't actually contain an explicit allegation of an infringement of one of the exclusive rights of the copyright owner. Instead, this theory looks to section 1201A and 1201B of the Copyright Act. Those sections make it unlawful to provide false copyright management information or to remove or alter copyright management information. The important thing to understand here is that these 1202 claims are still implicit claims of copyright infringement. The reason is because both of these subsections require a nexus to copyright infringement to be violated. To violate either subsection A or B, you need to know that you're falsifying or removing copyright management information. And even if we take that for granted, then as the second element, you need to either intend to induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal infringement under 1202A, or you need to have reasonable grounds to know that your conduct will induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal infringement under 1202B. What this means is, is that if there is no underlying copyright infringement, if the copying of all this training data to train an AI model is fair use, then the fact that the copyright management information disappears along the way is not infringement. You still need some underlying infringement to have a successful 1202 claim. Copyright theory number one is the most straightforward and logical. It argues that all of the copying that took place to train a model like GPT-3 or GPT-4, that that was copying under the Copyright Act, which it clearly is, and that there is no applicable defense or justification. And that's where the claim is debatable. I think that if the model outputs are not substantially similar to individual copyrighted works in the training data, the copying required to assemble and process the training data is likely to be fair use under US law. And I'll explain this in more detail in a few minutes. Copyright theory number two is that the AI models themselves are infringing copies of the training data. Under US law, a copy is a material object in which a work is fixed from which the work can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated, either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. This is significant because if you look under the hood at a large language model, all you're going to see is incomprehensible math. You can't directly read or observe the information in the model. You only know what is in the model by querying the model and seeing what results. So the only way to know if a model is a copy is by assessing its outputs. If the outputs are substantially similar to specific copyrighted works in the training data, it's fair to say the model is or contains a copy of those works. The test for similarity is whether the ordinary observer would regard a given output as substantially similar to the protectable expression in a given input. This can happen with generative AI, but it's extremely rare. 
generally this kind of memorization is seen in the computer science field as a bug to be fixed, not a feature to be embraced. The third copyright theory is that the AI model itself is inherently a derivative work based upon the copyrighted works in the training data. This sounds like a good theory because the model would not exist without the training data. And so anything the model produces is derivative of the training data. That's misusing and misunderstanding the word derivative. Causation is not the test of what makes a derivative work in American copyright law. Under US law, making a derivative work means recasting a significant amount of the primary work's original expression into some kind of new form or new expression. If the model is not, in some sense, a copy of a work in the training data, then it's also not a derivative work based on the training data. So this theory, although it initially sounds impressive, once you understand how derivative work rights work, adds absolutely nothing. Copyright theory number four is that the model outputs are copies or derivative works based on the training data. We can really address this with what we've already discussed. As noted under theory two, sometimes, but rarely, generative AI models will memorize and reproduce their training data. If and when this happens, then it's correct. The model outputs are copies or derivative works based on the training data. But as noted under theory four, in most cases, when the model outputs are not substantially similar, where there is no reproduction, then there is nothing to the derivative work argument. So now let's turn to the main question. Why is it that copying without permission that underpins most of the construction of generative AI in the US today is regarded as fair use rather than copyright infringement? Let me begin with a few observations about the fair use doctrine. The fair use doctrine, as many of you may know, allows for technical acts of copying that would otherwise be infringement, and it makes those actions non-infringing. The fair use doctrine was codified in America in the 1976 Copyright Act in section 107. However, fair use or its common law predecessor, the doctrine of fair abridgment, has been part of Anglo-American copyright law in one form or another for almost as long as there has been Anglo-American copyright law. We see the first cases on fair abridgment very shortly after the enactment of the Statute of Anne in 1710. Although admittedly, the fair use doctrine today has evolved significantly from those early prototypes. Section 107 of the Copyright Act lays out four factors to consider in evaluating a claim of fair use. Those factors are the nature of the work, the purpose and character of the use, the amount and substantiality of the portion used, and market effect, or as the statute says, the effect on the market for or the value of the copyrighted work. Two important observations to make about Section 107. Section 107 is not meant to be a checklist. It's not a scorecard where you tick off each box one by one. Closer for examination, all of the factors turn out to be related. It turns out that how much of the work you use is a very important consideration in figuring out market effect, and it also reflects on the purpose and character of your use. It turns out that the nature of the work is not really an independent factor. It's really the context through which you have to evaluate all of the other factors. The second point is that you can't understand American fair use law just by reading the statute. You have to read the cases. And in particular, since Campbell versus Acuff Rose decided by the Supreme Court in 1994, the concept of transformative use, a word that doesn't appear in the statute, has loomed large in American fair use law. This brings us to the non-expressive use cases. U.S. courts have consistently held that technical acts of copying that do not communicate an author's original expression to a new audience are fair use. I call these uses non-expressive uses. Examples of this kind of non-expressive use include software reverse engineering, the process of copying object code in order to distill or figure out the uncopyrightable keys to interoperability, Another example of non-expressive use is an automated plagiarism detection program that 
compares new works to a set of base works in order to see whether the new work was perhaps copied from one of the prior works. Um, third, copying HTML web pages to create a search engine index, copying printed library books to allow researchers to do statistical analysis on the content of those books, and more importantly, on the contents of whole collections of books. And finally, copying those same printed library books to create a search engine index. Let's think about why the results of these non-expressive use cases actually make quite a lot of sense. The purpose of copyright law is not to prohibit the mechanical act of copying for its own sake. The purpose of copyright law, at least in the American tradition, and I think in other countries as well, is to protect the author's rights with respect to her original expression and the communication of that original expression to the public. If that's right, if that's a fair summary of the underlying rationale of copyright law, that helps us make a lot of sense of the fair use doctrine. Fair use is not a tax or a subsidy. Fair use is not meant to oppose copyright. Fair use is meant to make copyright work, to make copyright make sense. And so if you're going to have a theory of fair use, it needs to reflect the fundamental purpose of copyright. When I look at the fair use cases, and I think when the courts look at the fair use cases, they see that uses that don't threaten the author's interest in, com in controlling the communication of her expression to the public should be fair use. So in the context of parody, parody is fair use because although it takes some of the author's original expression, it uses it in such a different way, in a way that reflects back on the original, that it's not competing with or substituting for the author's original expression. It's instead doing something entirely different. Non-expressive uses go one better because a non-expressive use by definition or axiomatically doesn't communicate the author's original expression to the public. And so it makes sense that for the same fundamental reasons that parody is fair use in the United States. So now let's consider whether this logic of non-expressive use applies to generative AI. Recall that a use is non-expressive if it doesn't communicate the author's original expression. In a traditional non-expressive use case, like a Happy Trust or Google Books or in the reverse engineering cases, we have copyrighted works being subjected to some kind of analytical technical process and producing output in the form of metadata. In Happy Trust, that output was statistics about the contents of printed books. In Google Books, it was basically library catalog card information. That metadata is obviously nothing like the original expression in the original books and is therefore non-infringing. Generative AI is different because we have works containing original expression used as an input so to this mathematical analytical process and then producing not just raw data, but new digital artifacts that can be quite similar in kind to the artifacts that were on the input side. The question, I think, is not whether the new artifacts are expressive in some constitutional First Amendment sense. The question is whether these artifacts contain some of the original expression of the works that were on the input side. The answer to that question is that usually they don't, but it depends. Now I'd like to talk about why generative AI models usually don't copy or produce copies of the works in their training data, because this is really the critical question for the fair use analysis in the United States. I have three observations that I'd like to take you through. The first is that copyrighted training data is not copied into the model. People talk about works being ingested into the model. I think that that's a really unhelpful and misleading characterization. So think about a large language model like GPT-4. GPT-4 is a model trained to predict the next token in a series of tokens by making a guess about the missing token. And tokens are essentially quite similar to words, although in some cases they're just parts of words. So you can think of GPT-4 as a model trained to predict the next word in a series of words. Take a sentence like, 
the girl with the dark. Complete the sentence. I think some of you would have guessed the answer was hair. I don't think any of you would have thought the answer was propeller. The reason that you think hair is plausible and propeller is implausible is partly to do with your understanding of English grammar, syntax, what the rules of the structure of sentences are. And that's something that a model like GPT learns through exposure. But the reason that some of you thought of hair is that commenting on the appearance of girls is something that we do in Western literature, apparently. And so it makes sense. It makes sense, not just in a linguistic context, but in a sort of cultural context. If you guessed hair, you didn't guess it because you read it once and your brain made a copy of what you read. If you guessed hair, you guessed it because it made sense to you based on everything you have learned about English grammar and about our society and about how sentences are constructed. GPT is the same. The model weights in GPT are adjusted after each round of guessing. When it guesses well, the factors that led it to guess well are essentially upvoted. When it guesses badly, those factors or weights are essentially downvoted. And over many, many rounds of guessing, the model goes from being completely random at the beginning to eerily good at guessing the next word. But the model hasn't copied any of the sentences it was exposed to. What it's done is learned from all of those sentences. And that's an important difference. I know that the metaphor of machine learning working like the human brain can be overdone. I know that the metaphor of large language models learning like a student can be overdone because they do learn in a slightly different way. However, if we have to choose between the metaphor of the model learning like a student or copying like a scribe in a monastery, it's clear that the former is correct and the latter is wrong. The second point I'd like to make is when these models learn, they tend to learn at a level of abstraction, at a high level of abstraction that is uncopyrightable. So if you take a look at this image, on the left, you'll see a collection of images paired with the label coffee cup that I found in the stable diffusion training data. On the right, you'll see a coffee cup that I produced with stable diffusion. The coffee cup on the right is similar in some ways to the, one, to the ones on the left. Right? It's round, it's white, it looks like it's maybe porcelain, it has a single small handle, and it has brown to black liquid. But the model has abstracted away from these much more richly detailed images. So we don't have cakes, sunsets, sunrises, bodies of water, women with smooth skin, men with facial hair, newspapers, etc. We're just left with the consistent abstract features that are then used to create a new digital artifact. Another point along the same lines is that when these models are prompted and produce some new, new digital artifact, whether that's new text or new music or new images, they are usually doing something that is actually quite novel. So I asked Midjourney for a teddy bear in rich opulent clothing with a hypnotic stare reading a newspaper. And what it gave me is more than just a cut and paste or a mishmash of teddy bears, people reading newspapers, etc. What it gave me was this richly detailed and quite novel image, an image that is also surprising. It's true the image would not exist or it wouldn't look like this if there were no newspapers or teddy bears in the training data. But what the model has done is it's formed a latent construct of all of those individual things and then navigated to a sort of a, an implied or inferred point that combines all of those latent constructs and given us something actually quite new and surprising. Um, and I say surprising because even though I asked for a hypnotic stare, the principal actor in this photo is wearing sunglasses. And so for all we know, his eyes are closed. There are three complicating considerations I'd like to address. Essentially three reasons why 
the things I just told you might not always be true. First, sometimes the models really do memorize the training data. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot. When it does happen, it's usually because <clears throat> there are too many duplicates of the same work in the training data, or in the image context, the image is paired to some highly unique text description. And it also has something to do with the ratio of the size of the model to the size of the training data. This is what the computer science literature has figured out over the past 18 or 24 months. However, what the computer science literature has missed so far is the Snoopy problem. The Snoopy problem is that the more abstractly a copyrighted work is protected, the more likely a model is to copy it. And in particular, we call the Snoopy problem the Snoopy problem because it really applies to copyrightable characters. I'm sure most of you know what Snoopy looks like. Well, Stable Diffusion and Midjourney do as well, right? Those models have learned Snoopy just the same way they have learned how to draw a banana or how to draw an aeroplane. They've learned Snoopy very well because different images of Snoopy are consistently labeled as Snoopy and have a set of characteristics that is consistent across those images. So the model knows very well how to draw Snoopy and what a Snoopy cartoon should look like. It's not just a problem with visual copyrighted characters. We also protect novels at quite a high level of abstraction, such that even if you have a novel where you just extend the story by imagining the main character meeting the author some years later, as uh, in a relatively recent case involving J.D. Salinger and The Catcher in the Rye, that could be found to be an infringing derivative work. So your average LLM these days knows enough about your favorite novel to help you write an infringing sequel, and that infringing sequel would be a derivative work. The third point I want to make here is that when infringement does happen, it can be caused either by the model, by the user, or some combination of the two. And for example, with a little bit of prompting, I was able to get GPT-4 to start writing a sequel, an unauthorized sequel to Ian McEwan's quite famous novel, Saturday. I called this sequel Sunday, and I imagined it taking place one year later. The conceptual problem that we really need to think about more in copyright law is how to attribute responsibility between the people who create the model, the people who run the model, and then the people who use the model. And that's something that I think will require further development. But when I say to you that an LLM can be used by a sufficiently knowledgeable and determined user to infringe copyright, I think it's important to note that the same is also true of a typewriter. And so it's not immediately obvious how we should be allocating responsibility between the people who create and operate these models and the people who use them. I have a lot more to say on this topic, but I'm fairly confident I've already exceeded my time. And so, so I thank you for your attention. If you'd like to know more about this issue, you can look for my articles on the SSRN website. Thank you.